You know, prayer is, prayer is a pretty fun thing because it's just talking. But I remember, I remember those prayers as a kid. See, I didn't grow up in a house that would go to church, never saw a Bible, but I learned some prayers even as a young kid. You guys probably learned some of these prayers as well. And I'm not just talking, you know, rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, yay God. Like, who, who's, who's prayed that one? All right, yeah, I, okay, a couple people actually raised their hand. I heard some yeses, but they didn't want to, like, be public with it. But I remember, I remember something a little bit more in depth as a kid. I remember, you know, God is good, God is great, let us thank him for this food, amen. And I always thought, like, that's how you prayed. Like, you had to say those exact words. It made sense as a kid. And I remember then also at nighttime, what you'd have to do is say this prayer. Maybe you can even say this one with me. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I saw several of you repeating that with me. And for me, that was kind of a scary prayer because like, I didn't know who God was. I mean, when I was a kid, like, you aren't supposed to take things from other people. And so I didn't know who was taking what from me. That was a scary one. And as I got a little bit older, I said, you know what, these prayers are meaningless because I'm talking to someone that I do not even know. That was my thoughts, meaningless prayers. And as I thought about meaningless prayer, I'm like, well, I don't even know this person, so I didn't even know if this person is alive. And therefore... Are they even being heard? And then I grew up, came into relationship with Christ. It was later in life. I mean, I was probably 8 to 12 years old when I was reciting those prayers. And, you know, eventually I kind of stopped other than when my parents would make me. I wouldn't say the one before bedtime. I'd just say the one before the meal because my parents would say, you had to, otherwise you didn't eat. So I kind of would say that one because I kind of liked food. But as I got older, as I came into relationship with Christ, I understood prayer a little bit differently. But I still had those wonders from time to time. Is he really hearing all my prayers? And some of you, some of you are wondering that very thing. Because some of you, just a few weeks ago, admitted, and we, we kind of brought people up to the altar. They're like, yeah, I've been praying something for a month, a year, a decade, some of you more. The same prayer over and over again, and some pretty serious prayers. And you wonder, are they being heard? I mean, I was wondering that after I came into relationship with Christ. I was about 27, as I said, and I started praying for the grown-up things because I understood God now as my father. And man, I would think that my father would want me to have some nice things. New house, new car, you know, girlfriend. Like There were some important things in my life. And I was like, I'm praying for these. And I spent some time praying. But nothing was happening. So was God even hearing me? And I think that's where some of you are at. See, but the problem was those prayers that I was praying, you know, new car, new house, it was all about me, you know. And as I've matured in Christ, I've realized that those prayers shouldn't be about me quite so much. Oftentimes, they should really be about others, and more importantly, they should be about God. And some of you are having still those thoughts, well, I'm praying for others, I'm praying for my child to come to Christ, that prodigal child. I'm praying for someone to be healed of a disease that seems to have no cure. I'm praying for provision. I'm praying for deliverance from addiction or someone else's deliverance from addiction because God would not want someone to be addicted to something that's just unhealthy. I'm praying for things other than for me, and yet God is still not hearing my prayers. How many people feel that one? Years go by, and you're still praying the same prayer. 
Is God hearing our prayers? What's he doing? If there is no answer and it's been so long, what is he doing? See, there's promises in Scripture. That's what the series that we have been in is all about, promises in Scripture. And what I want to do is I want to show you some promises specific to prayer. Some things that Scripture says that we can hold on to even in the toughest times. You know what the first one is? It's simple. God hears your prayers. There's no wondering. There's nothing like a little kid sitting around going, who is this that I'm praying to and is he even alive? Is he hearing me? God hears your prayers. See, but people don't always believe that. And so what I want to do is I want to help you understand that when, when you are not seeing results from your prayers, rest assured that he hears them. 1 John 5.14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. How do we approach God? In prayer. We approach him. He's in his throne room and we have full access to him in his throne room to be able to walk up to him and just say, hey, God, to say, Heavenly Father, to say, Lord, here's my need. Here's what's on my heart. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, some of you have already jumped ahead of me, but I want to focus on he hears us. How did you jump ahead? You're already on to his will. You're like, I know that's an important one. But you know what he hears us means? If you actually go back to the Greek, it means not deaf. The ears are wide open. He hears every single word that you speak. He even hears them before you speak them. He knows what's going to come out of your mouth before you say a word, before you utter a breath. He hears. He hears in Greek, not deaf, and also means considers or attends to. So he hears the words that's coming out of your mouth, and he considers, he contemplates, he thinks it through. And God, being all-powerful, all-knowing, understands. He understands the situation. He already knows the situation before you got yourself into it, before you were thrust into it, because sometimes we're in these situations that we're praying for, and it's our own doing, and sometimes it's not our doing, it's someone else's doing, and we're just, we're just a byproduct of it, but we're still in the mess. He considers all that, he knows it all, and is already starting to work things out in one way, shape, or form. What he desires, though, is for us to just simply open ourselves up to him and pray so that he can begin to hear our hearts. That means that he hears the good prayers and the bad prayers, you know, because there are some prayers that I've prayed, at least early on, I'm like, that's a bad prayer. That's just a bad prayer. I remember the very first prayer that I prayed that I thought was actually legit. And most of you would say, it's a bad prayer. I just called God out. I remember having an absolute night terror. I've shared my testimony before with you, but I remember sitting on my bed saying, all right, God, if there is a God, you're going to have to prove yourself to me. <laughs> that doesn't sound like much of a prayer. Man, I've read in Scripture, I've read in Matthew where Jesus teaches our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That didn't sound anything special like that. But you know what? It wasn't really that bad of a prayer. It wasn't that bad of a prayer. Why? Because it might have sounded like a snotty little kid, but it was genuine. It was genuine and raw from the heart because that's what God wants. God will answer a genuine prayer. What do I mean by genuine? Like I said it comes from the heart. It comes from the place where you're not doing it just to show off. You're not doing it for any other reason other than to seek him and how earnestly he'll understand 
he understood that I meant no malice whatsoever. As long as it truly was trying to seek him for me. And that's what I was doing. I called him out, but I was trying to seek him and his kingdom. Because it was that prayer that brought me to salvation. It brought me to the point where I realized that God was real. God answered my genuine prayer in the most private of places, just in my bedroom in the middle of the night. God answered that genuine prayer. You know what it says in Matthew 6? Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6. This is right before Jesus teaches people how to pray. You know, that's, that's another way that we know that God hears prayers. Because God himself, Jesus, God in the flesh, taught us how to pray. And he says this right before that. And when you pray... Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Don't pray like the hypocrites. You know, people used to stand around back in Jesus' day, even before Jesus would come. There'd be rabbis, there'd be others. They'd stand around on the street corners. They'd stand around there at the temple. And they would make a big spectacle of themselves, to be quite honest. God, you are so great and mighty. You are the best. Lord, move upon your people, I say. That'd be their prayer, something like that. It'd be all grandiose. It'd be very showmanship. It'd be to draw attention to themselves. Look at how holy that guy is. Look at him. Look at how polished his words are. Not like God, if there is a God, calling him out. But very polished, very refined, and very loud and boisterous. All to get attention so that people would say, now that, that's a holy man. But that's not what God wants. He just wants your heart. He just wants it to be genuine. And how can we be genuine? One of the easiest ways is to get away from the distractions, to get away from other people, to get away into our room, as it says. Some people, they have what they call a prayer closet. Some translations even say prayer closet, to get into your closet, to get away from all the distractions, to get away from all the people so that no ounce of flesh can rise up in us, to even begin to try and pray to impress people. Because it's not about the people. It's about you and God. It's about you just pouring your heart out to him, saying, Lord, here I am, This is what I'm asking. It's a genuine prayer. But you know what? Sometimes we just don't know what to pray. It doesn't matter. God still wants to hear it. Because he also says to pray for his will. You remember that verse before John 5, 14. According to his will. See, the hypocrites weren't praying according to his will. They're praying for show so that they could impress other people. Other people would be impressed by them. Jesus also taught us, and we read it in Scripture if you go to Matthew 26. You don't have to turn there now. I've got it up on the screen. Matthew 26, verse 39. One of the most simple and hardest prayers to pray, which should be actually every single prayer that you have. Straight from the heart, but it says... In verse 39, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Here's the important part. Here's the part that you need to underline and highlight. Yet not as I will, but as you will. God, I've said a whole lot of words to you, and that's what I desire. That's what I kind of want. But Lord, 
whatever you think is best. Your will be done in my life, not my will. See, Jesus, Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross. He was getting ready to go to death. He was gonna die. Can you imagine that? Knowing that you're going to die and being able to say, God, I don't wanna die, but if you want me to die, your will be done. Now imagine some of those hard situations that you're praying for. Man, I've prayed in some of those hard situations for people. I lost a friend to brain cancer. Terrible. 10 years he fought it. Going through surgeries and chemo and radiation. My will? Did I have my friend here? God's will? God's will was to heal him, same as I was asking for. It just looked a little different than I was wanting. God's will still was done. He was healed. He knew Christ. He understood where he was going, and Todd was healed. It doesn't make your prayers any easier. It makes it hard. But we can rest assured that his will is always perfect, even in the hardest of situations, even in the hardest of prayers. When you learn to pray genuinely for God's will, it will always be best. And you know what? Like I said, my prayer for Todd, hmm, it didn't quite get answered the way I was expecting because God doesn't always answer our prayers the way that we're expecting. See, God sometimes, he answers them th one of three ways. Because God will answer every prayer, but one of three ways. There's always that answer, yes. That's what we're always hoping for. Whatever we ask for, we want it to be yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be asking in the first place. And those are the easy ones. God, this is what I want, and you receive it. And sometimes in very short measure. And you go, praise God. You know what? I prayed for it and then it came true and that's awesome. And that is the easiest way to praise God, isn't it? You ask, you receive, and that's great. That's the easy one. Yeah, but then there's that other way that's a little bit tougher. Not right now. Not right now. See, his answer is yes, no, or not right now. Oh, can you imagine that? Can you imagine maybe even hearing a yes, but knowing, he says, it's going to be a while. Can you imagine that yes being quite a ways down the road? Years and years and years. You know how long Israel prayed for the Messiah to come? Decades, generations. You know, there was 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they prayed for the Messiah, and they heard nothing from God. No word of the Lord was heard. Can you imagine handing that prayer down from generation to generation to generation? In Luke chapter 2, and I don't have it on the screen because it's a lengthier passage, but I want, I want to read this to you. I want to take just a little bit out of it. But Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 25, just listen. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting. Down to 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. This is a prophet of God who had been praying for the consolation of Israel. Know what a consolation prize is? It's that little prize, even though you didn't win. It's almost like the participation trophy. You know, like, oh, here's a little comfort for you. Here's a little something to, to soothe the pain of losing. He's praying for the consolation, the comfort of Israel, who had been oppressed under different rule had been in exile, got to return from exile, but things just weren't quite the same. They hadn't heard from God in so long. 
He had been praying and praying and waiting, and he had an answer. The answer was, hey, you're not going to die before you see this. Well, God, how long do I have to wait? When is it going to come true? God, it's been a lot of years. You told me I was going to, God, I'm getting old. Waiting for years for that answer to come. That's a hard one. I'm going to jump down to verse 36. There's also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. She also was waiting. She also was praying. She was looking for the same consolation of Israel. She was looking for the Messiah, the promised one, the one that God said would come. And she prayed. But not right now is what she heard for a long, long time. And yet what we see from Simeon, what we see from Anna as they worshiped the whole way through. When you're praying, when you're praying for that answer to come, that when you're praying and wondering, did he even hear? Know that he hears and know that he will answer. Sometimes, though, we just have to continue to worship because sometimes we just lose focus. We lose focus on him. We lose focus on him in our life. We just lose that focus and we need to continue to worship as we pray in all of our life. But then there's that other answer that becomes even more and more challenging, the answer of no. When you pray and the answer is no, why? Why is it no? because it's not God's will. And maybe sometimes we just need to go back and revisit those prayers and make sure that they're genuine and make sure that we're worshiping the whole way through because if we're truly worshiping, then we're truly accepting whatever his will is in all circumstances of our life, that his will is always perfect. And for that, we will worship regardless of the answer of our prayers because his will be done. So those are some promises that you can cling to even in the toughest circumstances. And I know that's not always the easiest thing to hear because we wanna hear all those yeses all the time. But God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Let us pray.